As this is the first practical video that we're doing, I thought it might be useful if I go through how I actually open Jupyter Notebooks to start with. In the future, I'll start directly inside Jupyter Notebooks, so this is the lecture you should refer to if you have any issues going forward. Now the way that I normally go about opening Jupyter Notebooks is I will just shift right click in Windows, open a command prompt window, and type Jupyter Notebook. That will then think for a few seconds, it will start it, oh it's opened off the side, and here is my Jupyter Notebooks instance ready to go. Now this works because Conda is on my path, if it's not on your path in Windows, uh, it may be easier for you to open Anaconda Prompt. So let me close this down, close that down, and I'll just copy the address where I am, and I'll run through how to do it with Anaconda Prompt. It's actually super simple, we will just simply open Anaconda Prompt, I will then CD to the correct directory, and then type in Jupyter Notebook again, it will open off screen again, and I'll drag that on, you can see we're right back where we started. And for the final way of doing it, we can simply run Jupyter Notebook directly from the installation. You'll notice it'll start up, let me drag it back on. And you'll see that it has started in a, the, our home directory, not the directory we opened it, but I know where mine is, it's within Google Drive, I go through a whole bunch of my files, and then I find the right directory. Because it saves time, the normal way I do it is I just shift right click to open command prompt in that location, you might have PowerShell instead, it'll still work. Jupyter Notebook, uh, in Mac, or Linux, you'd use Terminal, exactly the same thing, and up will start Jupyter Notebooks. And I'm going to come in here, and just go new, Python 3, and that will start a new Python 3 Jupyter Notebook ready for us to work with. So feel free to do this in a new directory that you create if you want to code along from scratch. If you've just downloaded the attached zip file which has all the notebooks already done, you can just start Jupyter Notebooks in that directory and then open the existing ones rather than creating a new one. So here I am having full screened and zoomed in a little bit more. Uh, remember that my Jupyter Notebooks is going to look a little bit different to yours. That's fine, yours will have a white background. I'll discuss how we can customize that. At, uh, I'll put that in the bonuses at the end of the lectures. You can skip to that if you want to customize it now. But for now, I'm just going to come up here, file, rename, and I'm going to call this one loading, and uh, we'll jump straight into it. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is click on the cell and press M to turn it into markdown rather than code. I'm going to paste in some markdown and press shift enter so that it turns into markdown. So you can see we're going to be loading data sets and we're going to jump straight in and use real data from Kaggle about heart disease. We'll run through a bunch of different methods of loading data in and you'll see which ones are essentially the best and yes, spoiler alert, it is pandas read CSV. If you're familiar with all of this, please feel free to skip ahead until you get to new content. This is going over the basics, but it has to be done to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Now it's good practice when you're coding to put all your import statements as soon as possible in the topmost cell. That way if someone's trying to run your code and they don't have everything installed, it will fail straight away. Not halfway through, not after waiting half an hour if you have long complex code, put all the imports you need at the top. So we're going to import NumPy as NP, we're going to import Pandas as PD, we're going to import Pickle so I can show you that, and then I'm just going to say, you know, the file name that we're loading in, so I've downloaded the data from this link and put it in the same directory, it is, I believe it's just under heart, let me just check that, heart.csv, that should be fine. So we're going to run that, make sure that everything imports successfully, it'll think about it, now it's done, fantastic. So let's talk about the best method, pandas read CSV, it's super simple to use. All you do is you say your new data frame, and data frame is pandas way of storing essentially tabular data, uh, is equal to pd.readcsv, and we'll just pass in the file name to then, if we just put that in, we don't get anything, that's fine. If you just go df and press enter, you'll see it spits out a huge summary of the data sets, 303 rows, 14 columns. To just get the top five, we'll go df.head and call that. Makes it much easier to view. I'm going to use that a lot simply because I've uh, zoomed in a lot on recording so the text is easier for you guys to read, but that means I don't have much screen real estate to play around. Feel free not to use head if you don't want. Uh, we'll cover other things you could use, but I'll generally use that, don't read too much into it. Alright, so that's pandas. Next up is numpy's built-in methods, which is load text and gen from text. 
Now, if I just uh, try to load the data in, I just go data is equal to numpy.load text, and I'll give it the file name. Whoops, I'll give it the file name, and then I'll say its delimiter is equal to a uh, comma. Normally, it just uses a space, and we have to just go skip rows equals one. Uh, the reason is, uh, well, I'll show you this guy. Skip, whoop, skip rows. If we run that, it works fine, and I can then go print data. Right, so it is a representation, but notice that the data is all the same. These are integers and floats mixed together up here in pandas, but down here everything is a float because load text assumes a homogeneous structure. If I get rid of skip rows, you'll notice that the thing just falls over, right? It doesn't realize that the header is an actual thing because this just gives you a matrix. It doesn't care about column names. So it's not quite as useful as read CSV. If we want column names, that's fine. We can use gen from text. So gen for text has a similar syntax. We can just go data is equal to numpy.gen from text. Now there's a whole bunch of stuff, so let me just type it out. All right, so that took me a little while to type out, so I sped through that part of the video. Let me now explain the code. You pass in the file name and delimiter just like before. dtype equals none means that NumPy should try and infer what the different data types of the different columns are. Names equals true means, hey, there's a header row. You should read that in. And this file is encoded in a UTF-8. Uh, you know, it's a, not a standard way of doing it. If I got rid of encoding, it would normally work for other files. For this specific file, I have to specify it because it's not ASCII. It's not generic UTF-8. It's utf 8 Great. If we print out the data, you can see it's loaded them in as this, uh, not this 2D array here, but this is a NumPy structured array. So essentially it's a list of tuples. If I keep scrolling down, oh my lord, okay. If we scroll all the way to the bottom, you'll see we've printed the D types there. So it's loaded in the, the actual column names and you see age is an integer, uh, but other things, let's see, let's find a, a float. Where are you? Aha, old peak is a float eight. So that means it's it's a double. It's an eight byte float. So we've successfully detected different types. We've got column names. Still not the most useful thing because pandas did that without any handholding whatsoever. All right, so let's do the really annoying part here where we practice loading in a file manually. If you don't want to do this, and I completely understand why, please skip ahead 30 seconds. This will take a little bit for me to code out. Again, I'm just going to go silent and code and I'll explain what I'm doing as I need. So first up, we want to create a function, load file. It's going to take a file name. That's great. Uh, we'll then open it. Use Always use with when you're opening a file. Never go, you know, open and then call close. Use the context manager. So with open file name, uh, I'm going to have to specify the encoding again, UTF-8 sig. Uh, we're going to open that as F. And then we're going to go, you know, data and calls is equal to nothing and nothing and then for i and line in enumerate oh this is so painful read split lines uh it's better to go read and split lines rather than f dot read lines uh simply because sometimes it doesn't split them properly or you get extra lines at the end uh it's just something that i've been caught out a few times before so i make sure that i do it this way and see if i equals zero so the first row should be the column headers so calls plus equals line dot split and we'll split on the comma frustrating else we'll add to the data we'll convert everything to a float for simplicity float x for x in line dot split and we'll split again on the comma oh this is annoying and then we'll turn this into a pandas data frame so we'll come out of here and df equals pd dot data frame i'll show you many different ways of creating data frames this is one you just pass in the 2d data and you just specify the columns and then we will return df. Uh, I'll just unindent that. Unind there we go. And then we'll just go load file, file name. And now I'll just call head because we do have a, a data frame coming back. So this should hopefully work. Haha, -ha. it works as expected. Notice everything is a float. Notice how much work we had to do when we could have just called pandas read CSV. But this is a, a general way that I would read in a spaghetti file, a file that has, for example, uh, a different number of columns on different rows. I've encountered those before. Massive, massive pain to load in. You can just put some extra if loops in. Uh, generally, if you have a file that's so badly mangled, I would say write a function like this that loads it in once into a sensible data frame and then save it out. Like, net, don't keep reusing this awful function. Use it once, turn the data into something useful, save it, and then just use read CSV. So much simpler.
All right, the final one that I'll touch on now, but by no means the final one in existence, is just using pickles. Uh, pickles have a little bit of danger because the pickle uh, format has changed between Python 2, Python 3, it might change in the future. Uh, so I really use them only as a temporary measure. I don't distribute my pickles to anyone, but if I have a huge data set, it's so much faster to load in a pickle than it is to load in a CSV file. So I'll save it out as a pickle whilst I'm working on it and always make sure that I, I load from a CSV initially, save out the pickle and then just keep using the pickle. So same as what I was saying up here, where you just do this once and save it out. Sometimes for large data sets, I do the same for pickles. Uh, the way that it works is simple. I've already saved one out as a pickle. So if you have a pickle, you can just go data frame equals pd.read underscore, and you've guessed it, pickle. And then we'll ask for heart dot pickle. And then we just go df dot head, just like normal. Now there are ways of doing this in Python using the default library, but let's not do that. All right, we've hit the 10 minute mark. So let me sort of wrap this up right here with a very quick recap. Uh, the recap is simple. Use pandas read CSV at every time you can. 99% of the time, this should work. It may require some tweaking into the input arguments, but it should work. Uh, pandas has a whole bunch of other read functions like read pickle. So if it doesn't work in that, if it's a binary data file, something else will probably work. You can even load Excel files in here. It's super, super easy. If pandas can't handle it, I doubt many other things can, frankly. And if you're using something like a manual function, just remember, please save it to a sensible format after you've done that once. And that way you can distribute and work on your data so much easier in the future. If you're wondering how to save out that data, uh, well, obviously there's a read CSV, there is a to CSV, uh, but I'll get into that in one of the later lectures showing all the different formats you can also save data out in. But that's it for this one. So jump into the next one. We'll keep getting into the good stuff. Oh wait, I lied, there is one more thing. I've been told by my producers that to try and spice things up a little bit in this course, at some point we will periodically be flashing a letter onto the screen throughout some of the lectures. If you piece together those letters, it will lead to a URL. The end of that URL gives you a cheat sheet summary of this entire course. I'll make sure there are some redundancies and it's something that you can guess uh, by the time you get most of the letters. So if you see a floating letter pop up for a few seconds during some of the lectures, uh, make sure to write it down or I guess check the Q&A section. I'm guessing someone's gonna spoil it pretty quickly. I won't remove the spoilers because it's a resource I want you guys to have. But if you wanna play along and play this little hangman game, that's fine by me as well.